Okay, there we go. That's watch the numbers roll in. Just gonna give them a moment for the room to open and everyone in the waiting room to enter. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Just give you a moment. Hello, hello, good morning. Well, I guess good afternoon for most of you, or good evening. Maybe we have a few good mornings if you're in Latin America. I'm from Poland, hello, hello. Okay, numbers are getting good. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you ever so much for joining us this afternoon, wherever you are in the world for this webinar on intercultural skills for real world, which is going to be presented by GS1 John and Rachel Gibbon, which is our first webinar in our Voices series for 2022. My name is Alex, and I'm going to be hosting the webinar today. Make sure everything runs as smoothly as possible. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to spend a moment to go over some of the functionality, some of the housekeeping for the webinar platform. So first of all, we do want to make this, this webinar as interactive as possible. So please make sure that you familiarize yourself with the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We want you to ask questions, respond to any questions that we ask as the, as the presenters um, and make it as interactive as possible. But please, when you do that, when you're using the chat, please make sure you send your messages to all panelists and attendees rather than just panelists. Because this way, everyone viewing the webinar can read your message rather than it being a private chat between you and the panelists, okay? Also on that bottom toolbar, you will see the Q&A button. This is to be used for more specific questions that you would like to ask the presenters or, or myself during the session. Uh, we'll do our very best to answer them as they come. In fact, you know, talking to Rachel and Cheer, we want you to ask questions throughout and we will do our very best to answer those questions as they come up, as they relate to the session, okay? Um, that said, we will have time at the end for some questions for a, bit, for a quick Q&A. So again, please use the Q&A box for that. Um, the final thing to say is that I know a lot of you are very keen to get your certificates and other information. Zoom will send out an email tomorrow in 24 hours time with a link to your certificate of attendance, with a recording of the session and a link to the lesson plan that comes with it all, okay? So, without further ado, let me introduce today's speakers. First of all, we have Chia Swan Chong, who is a writer, a communication skills trainer, and a teacher trainer, among many other skills. She is the author of Successful International Communication, and is also one of the co-authors of Voices, the new adult English language series from National Geographic Learning. And alongside her today, we have Rachel Gibbon, who is the global publisher for ELT at National Geographic Learning. And she's actually worked in educational pub publishing for over 16 years. And in that time has seen, overseen the publication of a number of flagship titles destined for classrooms across the world. So together we have two absolute experts on this topic. So, Cheer, Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. So today, Rachel and I, I'm, I'm really excited to be here with Rachel today. Um, and we're going to do it as a conversation. Uh, we're going to chat to each other about some of these different aspects of intercultural skills for the real world. But we're also going to invite you to give your ideas, your opinions, your experiences using the chat field. And hopefully it will feel like a huge group conversation that we're having. All right. So, Rachel, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> and welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many of you from so many different places join us today. So today we're going to look a little bit at what it means to incorporate culture and intercultural skills in the real world, for, for the real world, in our ELT classrooms, why that's important, 
and how we can go about doing that. We'll be using examples uh, and showing you some activities, videos from Voices, uh, as Alex mentioned, which is the new National Geographic Learning seven book series that uh, for, for adults and young adults. So first of all, how is culture normally incorporated into your English lessons? I'm sure the idea of talking about culture, teaching culture even, is, is not a foreign one to English mm. language teachers, is it, Rachel? No, I mean, surely there's culture everywhere in ELT books. Um, you know, it's something that teachers always talk to us about. It's some, you know, students are always curious to know how people live in other countries around the world. And it's something as National Geographic Learning that we really try to bring the, the world into the classroom. So, yeah, I suppose we need to dig a little bit deeper, though, to kind of know what we mean by that. Mm. You see, what, what, once I, I was doing this teacher training course, right, and I had a, a teacher trainee um, and she said to me, oh, I, I do culture all the time in my English lessons. Um, every once a month, I put up the Union Jack all over my classroom and I talk to my students about um, the royal family, uh, who are the members of the royal family in England, in the United Kingdom. Uh, I talk to them about the history of England. And I think these are very important things when learning English. Do you agree? Well, you know, when I came into English language teaching about 20 years ago, that was very much the expectation, you know, the the royal family, double-decker buses, you know, um, afternoon tea, and it was all very much about representing British culture um, around the world. But I think that people's perceptions and expectations have changed a little bit now. I, I think the key here is that English is, is not just used to, um, you know, travel to England and meet English people and, and British people per se. Um, a lot of our students are learning English because it's a great tool to have for international communication. You know, a, a Peruvian uh, businessman might speak to a Chinese teacher and the language they have in common to speak to each other happens to be English because they don't share first language. And so they aren't necessarily you know, uh, having to assimilate British culture per se, as opposed to, you know, if you learned Italian, you probably want to learn a bit about Italian culture, etc. Would you say that that kind of summarizes it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. And people want to bring themselves to a language, don't they? It's not just about learning the language, it's about how they're expressing themselves through that language and bringing their own experiences to it and their own culture to it. So not just about the culture, of the place that that language may have originally originated from. And like you say, English has become a lingua franca, you know, it's become a, a tool for global communication. And, and really, as you know, when we set out and started working together on this, you know, it, it, a really key thing is imagining our learners out in the world and what, what are they gonna need? What kind of, what are they going to need to be able to do with language? And, and that's really a question we asked ourselves. And, and then we tried to think of all the different ways that we could equip them for that, for, for global communication, didn't we? Absolutely. I think it's great to see how far English language teaching materials have come, how far course books have come. And I think Voices kind of represents that in many ways because it's about, you know, um, recognizing that English evolution. is a tool yes mm -hmm. um, English is a tool for our learners and so what we're doing is we're helping our learners use this tool in a better way um, how, how about you guys out there using the chat field how do you incorporate culture into your English lessons I think one of the ways that we, we are seeing more often in a lot of course books and also in voices is we're not just looking at British culture per se but we're looking at you know, culture and, and, and elements of culture from, from different parts of the world. And, and here are some examples of that. Do, do, do you know where these places are? I think Rachel knows where they are. I think the one on the right is in Sweden and the one on the left is Peru. Absolutely. The, the one on the right is um, an underground train station in Sweden. Isn't that amazing? It really is. It's really beautiful. And, and the one in Peru, it just makes you want to go there. <laughs> it makes yes. you want to travel again. Those are the salt hills, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that that's a natural ph phenomenon, really. It's just amazing that it's natural. <laughs> it just and I think so this is one of the ways that we can be a window onto the world, really. 
um, you know, we, mm -hmm. we can provide that to students. I think one of the most exciting things about learning the language is the idea that it's opening the world up to you. Um, and this is one of the really nice ways that we can do that in the classroom. And we don't just want to see places in, in America or in the United Kingdom. We want to see, you know, all these different places, all these, you know, these natural phenomena from all around the world. Amazing. Um, when we talk about culture, we also kind of talk about food, don't we? I mean, I think food, food is like this universal unifier. We yeah. all love talking about different types of dishes. And here we have on the right an infographic from Voices Elementary that looks at you know, uh, different trends uh, of food. And, and if you look further at the infographic, if you look at that page, you'll see that it, it even looks at different cultures way of looking at other people's food. So for example, you know, what do the Italians think about Chinese food, for example, and, and yeah. what, what do the Chinese think about French food, etc. And it's just great fun to, to, yeah. to, to look at the infographic. I remember when I was a teacher, food was definitely one of the topics that provoked some of the most lively conversations, especially because I, I was teaching in Italy and people care so passionately about food um, and I'm really curious to know what other people eat in other countries too and I think some of the teachers here who are commenting are saying that they like to make these kind of comparisons um, and even talking about how culture differs within the same country um, and making comparisons between their own culture and the cultures of the countries where the languages originate from or other students languages so yeah lots of different kind of dimensions there. Yes, um, we will definitely in, in a short while be looking further into what we mean by culture, because just looking at, at culture as a national culture kind of thing is, is one way of looking at culture. But there are also other ways of looking at culture and what we perhaps mean by culture. Mm -hmm. Are there any dishes here, Rachel, that you really would like to try <laughs> or, or have already tried? Oh, well, you know, it's not that far off dinner time. And it's quite a modest lunch, so probably all of them at this point. Yeah. Um, the Berbere ber ber curry looks particularly delicious. I was just yeah. going to say that curry looks amazing. I can't wait to have to try it. I've got to go to Africa to try it, don't I? It's from Ethiopia, it seems. Yeah. Right. Another way of looking at culture, aside from tourist attractions, places to visit and food, we also look at celebrations and we often see this festivals like the carnivals, even simple things like birthday mm -hmm. celebrations or on, on, on the slide, you can see Holly. Yeah, and this really kind of gets to the heart of, you know, bringing people, culture, bringing people together and how people interrelate with each other, that kind of aspect of, of cultural understanding. Absolutely. And, and through investigating and exploring their festivals and what they celebrate, we also learn about what's important to them, the kind of yeah. values that underlie those celebrations. What makes us human. What makes us human, absolutely. And here we have art. Two quite different types of art here. On the right, you have sort of more traditional uh, art from, you know, for a long time ago. And then on the left, you have something much more modern this was uh, an art depicting waves it's a, done in Ho Chi Minh City Vietnam am I right yeah yeah art is an interesting one because I think through art we it's almost like a window into understanding the ethos the values the attitudes and even the societal problems of that particular community wouldn't you say yeah, and the way that people perceive the world, um, sort of seeing that through their eyes. Mm, mm. So giving you that other perspective on the world and yeah, that's and really how you process it. That window into that moment where we could step into someone else's shoes and look at the world through their eyes. That's lovely. Of course, some people say, you know, you can't really understand someone's culture until you understand a bit about their history because, you know, what has come before us kind of influences how we are today. So here's an infographic from Voices Intermediate, um, looking at some of these key historical events. I love the infographics and voices, they're so visual. Yeah, it really brings it to life. Wasn't it Martin Luther King that said something about, um, we don't make history, history makes us, and Ooh. kind of the importance of understanding um, where things come from and where you come from and what shapes us. And our oh, sense wow. of collective belonging, really. So again, about how we how we interrelate as humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's profound. 
I was just going to say, oh, um, a picture speaks a thousand words, but no, you're much more profound than that. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we've been looking at sort of, you know, very typical uh, ideas of how we might deal with culture through a reading text, perhaps, or a listening text, you know, where we look at festivals and we look at food and we look at perhaps the art from different cultures. We might also look at certain behaviors that are, you know, that are different, like the way we greet each other might be different. How do you greet each people you meet, Rachel? Well, you know, there's kind of the pre-COVID version and the post-COVID version. Now everybody's a little bit unsure. I'm I'm kind of more of a hugger. So, you know, I would automatically go over to someone and hug them and kiss them. But um, now you have to kind of really gauge things a little bit more with people because some people feel a little bit nervous now. Um, it'd be interesting to see what it's like in cultures where that's really normal, actually. Um, you know, where it before COVID, it was really normal for people to reach out and hug and kiss each other. Are they still doing that now? Have people gone back to that now? I wonder if mm. they will. I remember writing this infographic during the whole pandemic and wondering whether to put the elbow greeting. <laughs> into the... Yeah, that's true. That's I was a new wondering, one. How, how long is that going to last? I hate that keep... though. I really hate it. But I suppose at least it's some way of acknowledging people. Do you write says namaste is the best way for their culture so greetings that's true because it's quite it's hygienic <laughs> I, I have heard that um, because of covid a lot of people are bowing to each other more as a form of greeting as opposed to shaking hands that's, that's interesting. really interesting <laughs> Beata says le lessons about greeting each other in different cultures can really turn out funny um Beata, funny in what way funny strange or funny ha 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 I'm just curious to know um, how it turns out funny. Uh, Ivana says, even if students groups are not a melting pot internationally, we can always compare smallest cultural units like family, local culture, tradition. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, we're going to talk about uh, different ideas of what culture means. Um, I, when I was teaching in London, I, I often taught multicultural classes. And, and I think the wonderful th thing about having a class of students from 10 different countries is they get to really share, um, you know, ideas, attitudes, beliefs of different cultures and, and, and conversations are always very exciting. But even if you have a monolingual class, I think we can still help students to discover um, other cultures, but also to, to find within that group, like Ivana saying, um, you might all be from Italy, for example, but you might be from different regions in Italy. You might be from different industries because, you know, someone who's an engineer might be very used to a different culture from someone who's a doctor or a teacher. And again, you know, culture doesn't have to be defined by national culture alone. And we live in such a more interconnected world nowadays. So, you know, especially younger people now, every, you know, they're all on Netflix and different sharing um, streams, you know, that they, they see they are exposed to films and, and TV series in different cultures and they observe and, and have the opportunity to be exposed to, to different cultures and customs, I think, too, don't they? So it, it, it provides us with even more opportunity as teachers to bring some of those um, differences into the classroom and to explore them. Absolutely. I, I think with the, like you said, with the internet, with streaming services, we, we just have a, um, more of a, more windows into different worlds. And hopefully that might mean more interest, more curiosity into how other people live, what they believe. Yeah. And uh, yes, that gives us the opportunity to bring that and use that as, as a vehicle for language, but also, you know, a great fodder for discussions um, speaking tasks, etc. And Justina is saying that she organises international Zoom meetings with her students um, to to learn from other students in other classrooms, and that's that's really nice. Um, that's a really nice idea, a really nice opportunity for them. I mean, that is one of we all have a little bit of Zoom fatigue lately, especially teachers, I think, um, from being online all the time. But it really does provide us also with some really nice opportunities to to have interactions that we might not have been able to have otherwise, like what we're doing now. Justine, a nice one. Very nice one. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so we kind of touched on this, didn't we? What is culture? Perhaps culture isn't just about national culture. Um, I often tell this story about how, you know, when I used to start presenting at ITAFL conferences, I started to, to learn from, from the best, really, some really amazing ITAFL presenters in the industry. And, and I, I started to, you know, realize that, hey, group work's good and pair work's good and having slides with lots of pictures and photos is really good. 
And I started to try and um, practice those presentation skills. And then I remember being transported into an academic conference where I tried to use those very same presentation skills in, in front of an academic audience. And it just fell completely flat. Oh. <laughs> like, I said, in pairs, you're going to talk about, and they all looked at me like, in pairs? Why are you putting us in pairs? What's that? <laughs> and and when, when I had slides full of pictures and photos, they just looked at me like I wasn't taking my research very seriously. And then when I started to make jokes and try and be entertaining, that was, that, that felt, oh, no. <laughs> it was just terrible. <laughs> and and that, that, to me, that was an example of culture shock because I had taken best practices from one industry and I tried to kind of transplant it into another industry without realizing that that academic industry had a whole set of different norms from the teachers practitioners industry and, and, and so that really made me understand what culture shock means have, have you ever experienced culture shock? well I don't know if I've ever told you um Chi, my first ever job after university was in steel manufacturing oh. <laughs> and I was working for an Italian company um and do it you know interpreting for them within that but you know most of my interfaces were you know welders paint sprayers guy and it was all it was a very male environment 20 years ago steel manufacturing was a very very male environment and a very different kind of communication style much more direct than what I'd been used to in a university environment so yeah I experienced a really huge culture shock and and yeah culture really is not just about countries you know it happens even within families if you meet someone you know your partner's family luckily my partner's family is very similar although they're in Turkey you know they've got a very similar kind of um, dynamic of how they communicate to each other as my family but sometimes you meet a friend's family and realize they're so different you know the the way that they even if they're from the same country they can, might be very different in their level of formality or how, how they communicate with each other Ah, oh, yeah. absolutely you know we talk about generation gap and that essentially is, is is a bit of culture shock going on there isn't it mm. because you have your parents who who have certain beliefs certain attitudes certain norms certain mm. expectations and then you have a different one and then you kind of argue with your parents because you think you don't see eye to eye mm. and and I think that's an example of culture cultural difference or intercultural yeah. communication when I tell my clients or my students um you know we're going to talk about intercultural skills there is this assumption, isn't there, that we're going to do do's and don'ts lists, you know. Yeah, there's the right and the wrong thing to do. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, you know, when in Japan, you know, remember to bring a gift when visiting an office and don't tip in a restaurant. And, and, and these things can be really, really useful. But I think one of the things I, I find about these lists is that, like you said, information is so, so, so readily available on the Internet. Students can find this information on their own they, they don't need me to spend two hours doing a lesson on do's and don'ts they can just go google it and they'll find blog posts and and pinterest lists mm -hmm. on do's and don'ts so that's just one of my issues with this the other issue i have with do's and don'ts is that they tend to generalize mm -hmm. over generalize and stereotype certain cultures have, have you ever had that experience yeah yeah you know it's 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 very difficult to avoid sweeping generalizations isn't it in this kind of a context um and and it doesn't really help you understand why it doesn't help you understand you know there might be a reason that is behind why that thing is a sensitivity and it's more useful to understand the reason behind it than to than to learn a rule because rules are not particularly memorable that is so so true like you said you know it's, it's about discovering the why and really really exploring what's under that Heidi here says unfortunately many people think that culture is just a list of do's and don'ts and that if you follow the list you'll be okay in that culture and I think that's the key message I really want to put forward is when we talk about intercultural skills when we talk about intercultural skills in voices we're not talking about stereotypes we're not talking about overgeneralizing because if, if you overgeneralize students there will always be a student in the class who goes, I'm from Italy and I'm not like that. And you, you, again, you're opening up a can of worms there, don't well, you? Well, it's maintaining the sense that somebody is different. It's kind of that someone is the strange, exotic other, isn't it? It's mm. kind of that they're different, intrinsically different to you in some way. But actually, if we want people to communicate well, then we've got to recognise that actually there are lots of things that unite us. You know, and you want to look for understanding a deeper kind of connection with people, which means having a deeper understanding of why they think something or they would normally do a certain thing, because that will provide that connection to them rather than 
seeing them as different and separate to you. And, and simply that you're different yeah. and 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 yeah you know we'll never be the same and let's just mm. stop it at that you are absolutely right and, and and i think a lot of the people listening to this webinar are probably thinking yeah so if culture is not do's and don'ts then then what is it then how, how can you cover intercultural skills but not do do's and don'ts so hopefully the rest of this webinar will 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 um shed a light on that so we talked about different cultural filters see if you can think of any more here are just some that i can think of um, you know, national cultures, one, regional cultures, another, you know, people from the north mm. of England might have a different culture, maybe, or a different set of norms from those from the south, maybe. Um, culture can be defined by, like I say, age, you know, your parents might have a different culture from you. Um, your profession, a group of engineers might have a different set of norms from a group of teachers, for example. Within a company, I mean, you've got, you've got corporate culture, but within a company as well, you could have the marketing department who have, who have a very different culture from, say, the IT department. And of course, this is not about generalizations. This is about really kind of understanding the different factors that influences, influence what we expect, what we consider our norms. And I think most of us on here will have experienced this in some form or another, won't we? I mean, if you've gone, if you've got a job in a different school, you know, the staff room in the new school might have a very different atmosphere to the staff room in the school that you were in before um, and the way that different the colleagues communicate with each other or the expectations of how formal um, the students are with you um, will mm. change from school to school, depending on the culture of that institution. Yes, how formal students are, how open you can be with them. Yes, absolutely. Holiday said, culture is a fluid, creative social force which binds different groupings and different aspects of behavior in different ways. And essentially, that is the definition of culture. We can't deny yeah. that culture exists. You know, a group of people, when they hang out for some time together, and if they have history together, may it be a group of friends or a group of colleagues or, uh, a, you know, a group of people managing a business together, they start to have certain aspects of behavior that becomes kind of like a silent agreement that, that that's the expectation of behavior. That's, that's how we react to things. And that force becomes what we know as culture. But again, culture is not static. That changes because we might behave one way when we are at work and we then might change that behavior when we're with our kids at home. And to remember that it is a fluid and very changeable social force. Yeah, a creative social force is, is just such a lovely way to put it, I think, isn't it? Because it recognizes the kind of dynamic nature of it, the fact and that it's formed by people. It doesn't just exist in isolation. So, you know, it is kind of the, how we create a sense of belonging, essentially, to something. Absolutely. But of course, some of you might be thinking, so we can't, you know, we don't want to do do's and don'ts. We don't want to stereotype. And it's all fluid and changeable. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with this, this, this very fluid, creative social force then? Now, before we go into that, and I'll, I'll promise to show you lots of examples from Voices, um, why though? Why is this important? Why, why should we be dealing with intercultural skills and this fluid social force with students? Oh, Nassar is asking, why is it a force? Hmm. So I, th I think it's a force because it's a powerful kind of energy, isn't it? it it's, something, it's, it's, it's something that kind of governs how we behave, our expectations, yeah. the way we see the world. I think that's what it is shaping. It's a force that shapes something, doesn't it? And it shapes the type of relationship we have, the interactions that we have. It has that influence. So I think force in that sense of influence. Mm, I like um, that. Yeah. The influence that shapes us. Oh, that's beautiful. And we're getting lots of ideas about why this is important. So in avoiding preconceived notions, Pierre is saying, Diraj is talking about minimizing conflict. Mary is talking about promoting understanding and tolerance. Diraj um, is about building empathy. Diraj mentioned minimizing conflict. There's something that I, I, I feel very strongly about. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes it's easy in an English language class to kind of only focus on sort of happy things like, you know, let's talk about holidays or what's in your backpack. 
<laughs> what you did this weekend. Yeah. But but I think, you know, it, it, we can't deny the fact that our students are going to go out and use English and they, they're going to get into situations. They're going to get into misunderstandings, miscommunication. There's, there might It might not be a massive conflict. It might not be an argument, but there might be certain elements of, you know, oh, that person's really rude to me or, you know, oh, I don't think that person got me right. I, I meant this and he misunderstood us as that. And, and to not ignore that type of conflict and to kind of really address it and say, how can we use conflict to help build relationships, to make our relationships stronger? Yeah, and Ian's taking it that sort of extra step as well. So the, to find common ground really in order to be able to do things with others. Mm. So you can achieve things together so that there is that kind of positive action side of it. Um, I think that's quite important too. And the I reason remember... we want to forge good relationships with people is, is so that we, can, that we can do positive things with them, that we can um, achieve more together. Yes, absolutely. If I remember correctly, in, uh, in, in Voices pre-intermediate, there's even a whole section about how to find commonality, how to find common ground and when mm. you meet someone for the first time. Let's have a look at these ones here. So we said earlier that our students are probably going to use English as a tool to communicate with people from different communities. And I think the moment our students use English, they're instantly engaged in intercultural communication. And we can't deny that. Mm -hmm. so that means they'll encounter people with different norms different behaviors from their own different attitudes to things and people with different interpretations of a communicative situation have you have you ever been in a meeting or a conversation where you've come out of it thinking this is what happened at the meeting or this is what happened in the conversation and then you realize later that your fellow colleague or friend who was in that same conversation to, got something completely different from you have you ever yes, had? definitely, definitely, completely different interpretations. Yeah, and Chu, you must see, you know, the, the the importance of this in action every day in in your role um, as an expert in intercultural communication, and you know, seeing students go out into the world and you know that have been at some point students of English and interacting with each other in real work contexts and facing these challenges. Absolutely. In, in fact, I have a funny story because uh, one of my colleagues said he was in company watching how some people were communicating in English and they were they were in an office um, and they spoke English as a second language and they were on a Zoom call, a, a sort of virtual meeting with another group of people from another country. And they went this meeting and they were talking, talking, and then the people in that country said, OK, we all agreed. And then they left the meeting. The people in that room that my friend was in Kind of looked at each other and went D -d -d do we know what we just agreed to and, and nobody had the same interpretation of that conversation so they decided <laughs> this is what they decided they said i tell you what we'll, we'll talk amongst ourselves and we'll just come to an agreement of what we think that means and that will be it <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's so dangerous because yeah and did know, they at some point share that with the people that had left the meeting already <laughs> <laughs> that's it nobody shared it with them they're just like well we'll, we'll 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 just come up with our own interpretation of what they mean and, and we'll stick to that one <laughs> yeah, I do think that that's probably what happens often in international diplomacy actually and that causes some of our problems in the world <laughs> I think communication problems is often key to a lot of issues that in any any situation any friendship relationship family community uh, companies you know, very often communication is kind of central to how people are with each other, how, how successful and how effective people can work together and be together. Mm. And if we can iron out and, and, and have a common understanding of how we communicate, um, I, I think a lot more can be done in a much shorter period of time. <laughs> Um, the, the other thing I, I think, Rachel, you and I have talked about is, is this difference between, um, you know, how very often when we're first starting to teach English, we, we tend to focus on very transactional communication, like how to order food at a restaurant or how to get information from a tourist desk. Um, and, and, and we kind of feel almost like, you know, as English teachers, how do we bridge that gap between going from sharing and getting information with English to building information, building relationships in English? Yeah, so because they're kind of quite transactional. Yeah, the, those situations that you're talking about, they're very kind of, 
you don't necessarily need to build a relationship with somebody in order to buy a ticket from them. <laughs> but then if you, <laughs> you know, you just need the basic skills of being polite, being clear. But if you're going to work with somebody, you know, on a regular basis and have regular communication with them, or if you're trying to build a friendship, obviously there's a whole set of other kinds of skills that become important. Absolutely. And I suspect, I think this is what Piotr is saying here, is that intercultural competence is often neglected in class materials. And I think perhaps because it's, it's kind of nebulous, it's kind of ambiguous. How do you deal with relationship building? It's such a massive yet vague topic and, and people shy away from that. It's, it's much easier to say, here's the language to give suggestions and recommendations. Here's the language to command someone to do something. Here's the language to order food with. But it's less easy to say oh here is how you build relationships in English with people yeah they're easy things to tick off and to concrete things that you can say that you've done whereas this is just such a huge area and maybe mm. also we we sometimes shy away because we think they're already adults why are we explaining to them how to communicate mm. you know mm. but as you know you, you're you know you have worked with people who are L1 speakers of English who've grown up speaking English, but they still don't have the, the, the necessary skills and they recognize that they might need to develop the skills that are needed to be effective communicators in intercultural situations. You know, absolutely spot skill on. Set. Absolutely spot on. Yes. Effective communication is not about, you know, your 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 ability to use the language as a as a sort of C2 speaker, because if that's the case, then every first language English user are, you know, will, will never have a misunderstanding and they will all be expert communicators, which we know are not, it's not necessarily true. I think everyone needs these intercultural communication mm -hmm. skills, whether you are an L1 speaker or not. Absolutely, absolutely. So from there, now we, we know that it's important that we help our students with this. How can we do it? It seems like such a huge topic, almost scary for us teachers. You know, we're English language teachers. How can we deal with all this stuff? So how we do it in voices, and hopefully that kind of addresses Piotr's comment that, you know, we're going to have intercultural competence not mm -hmm. neglected, but addressed in voices and addressed in a big way. And how we do it is we start with stories. Here's one. Have you ever had an experience like that before, Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's a whole new culture on Zoom that we need to develop because it, it, with, with the delay in timings, you know, understanding when to interrupt people, when there's a gap, um, it becomes a lot harder. But yeah, there's definitely, um, thankfully for me, you know, I'm from a family culture where everybody interrupts each other all the time. So when I went to live in cultures in countries where that's the more dominant culture that people are fast speakers who interrupt more um, and it's not seen as bad manners I was I was well prepared for that less mm. well prepared for when you know I've, I've encountered I've, um, people in workplaces that prefer a much slower style of kind of habit giving each person longer to speak I think we're quite similar in the, that respect yeah we're quite <laughs> like you know um, enthusiastic in our speaking style so we're happy you know for people to interrupt and we're happy to interrupt others and we, we're kind of like really fast moving in that sense with with the way we take turns and obviously not everyone is like that um, this little story is was was taken um, and sort of adapted from um, voices upper intermediate uh, where you see this infographic now there are many different ways of looking at turn taking but this is one of them so you've got bowling, which is like, Rachel, what you said earlier, people with a much slower mm. pace, people who are happy to have silences between turns, people who don't really like to interrupt each other. And that's a real sort of almost a hierarchy, as in who goes first and who goes second, and lots of pauses in between to really think about what that person's just said. I, on the other hand, I think I suspect like Rachel, we are rugby communicators. We're fast paced, you know, we're happy with interruptions. For me, when I meet someone who is a bowling communicator, I almost sometimes feel like those pauses are awkward silences that I need to fill. And I've got to remind myself, I've got to take a step back and go, no, 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 don't fill those silences. Maybe those silences are not awkward. They're just needed, necessary silences. 
Yeah. And also, yeah, I mean, the other thing that I find challenging about that is in order to really listen, I need to communicate. (laughs) So if I have to sort of not speak for long periods, I find it quite hard to maintain attention. So if you find yourself with a bowling person and they're speaking at length, you know, my way of, of, of listening is to contribute. I, I, I totally get you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally on the same page there. You know, one, one student of mine, I remember I had a class and we, we, we had a massive lesson about bowling, basketball and rugby. And the students went past, you know, like really unpacking that story that you just saw with, with June. Yeah. And, and I remember at the end of the lesson, there was this one student, she was from Turkey, and her face, that expression on her face was just unforgettable. She looked at me, she just suddenly, it was like at this eureka moment. And she said, oh, wow, I get it now. Hold on. So I have some classmates and they never really talk much in class and they don't always put their hand up. And they, I thought they had no opinions and they were just boring. Oh, maybe they do have opinions, but they're just bowling communicators. And, and that look on her face was unforgettable. It's just it's like this aha moment. And that's kind of what I really hope with these communication skills and intercultural skills spreads in voices is that aha moment that students might mm-hmm. just get that very, very simple piece of information and go, oh, I see. Yeah, that's it's different. given them that chance to reflect and really think about their own communication style. Mm, absolutely. Here's a slightly different one. Here's a quiz for you. So we've gone from infographics to quiz. In the chat field, and, 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 and you too, Rachel, where would you stand on this scenario? So you've got Dorina and Erica. And Erica makes a mistake in English. Dorina corrects her, even when they're with other people. I think this is a classic kind of example of the situation you talked about before, where different people will have very different interpretations of what's happening here. So, so already lots of B's, a B and lots of C's. So lots of people who think this is impolite. Oh. oh, are you influencing each other or do you really think C? Ah, that's that's a good point. Lots of people agree. A couple of B's, a couple of people who think it's neither polite or impolite. For the people who said B, why do you think it's not, in, not polite or impolite? That's a good point. I'd, so Alan is saying, I'd argue that rugby communicators communicate to less with their words. Okay, all right. So that's relating to the previous point. I mean, my immediate reaction to this year was, I thought, you know, is Darina trying to show off and show that she's a better speaker of English mm. than Erica? In which case, you know, kind of trying to show up your friend, to embarrass your friend in a way to... To, to show how great you are, you know, is definitely impolite and possibly worse than impolite. And that was my immediate response. I thought, why would you do that in front of other people? Yes, yes. What did no, you no. think? <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. I think that with other people, there's the part that disturbs me because um, I think in a lot of cultures, I come from Singapore and face is a big thing. Um, you know, to, to embarrass someone in front of other people is, is you know, is making them lose face. And I, I think face is, is a very, very important cultural concept in a lot of cultures, in a lot, a lot of cultures. And in mm-hmm. fact, it's so important that I believe in, in, in um, Voices Intermediate Plus, we have a whole double page lesson on face and, and, and how different people consider what's, you know, what makes them lose face, because what makes me lose face might not be the same as what makes you lose face. And, and, and I think with these things, there are no correct or incorrect answers, but the, the whole idea is to, to really help students to, and teachers as well, to reflect and to really think about different perspectives and even different contexts. Yeah. And, and a lot of people are pointing out here as well that consent and pre-agreement is also quite important here so if they make the agreement that that is you know that that behavior is acceptable and it's you know um accepted and welcomed by erica then it would be okay um but if there's not that prior agreement between them that's what kind of makes it not okay yes context is everything maybe erica said to dorina dorina you know correct me no matter what I what happens, whatever situation we're in, just just correct me. So we we, we don't know the context fully, I suppose. Mm. That too. But let's go by instinct. Instinctively, looking at this scenario, would you say it's A polite, B, ah, neither, or C 
impolite. Where do we stand with this one? Yeah, it made me wonder whether or not, you know, is David asking questions that Jean So feels a bit uncomfortable about? You know, maybe he's asking him something that he considers too personal, or maybe he just doesn't really want to engage in a conversation. Or maybe David is of a higher position than Junso, like maybe David's his teacher or his girlfriend's father, and he's giving the one word answers as a sign of respect because he is used to a more hierarchical style of communication. Might, might that be it? One and a lot things? of people here seem to be thinking this one is neither polite nor impolite. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Michelle's asked a very good question. What's their relationship? What's the context? Mm. Oh, Junso is showing David she's not interested in him, says Alan. Such a di such different interpretation yeah. of a simple scenario. And uh, somebody's just shows... assuming Diraj is assuming it's teenagers. Oh. That maybe Junso is a teenager. Is is it because teenagers are, are, are sort of I'm, I'm overgeneralizing, but but do teenagers are, are teenagers known for giving one word answers? <laughs> I don't have any teenagers. My kids are very young. So all that to come ahead of me. Here's another one. Now this, this one, I'll tell you this. I had a class some time ago and this topic was the topic of conversation in my class for a good half an hour. My class was just arguing about this, whether it's polite or impolite. What do you think? And I think all sorts of things will affect this because, you know, some for some people it will be about gender um, and whether or not, you know, there are perceptions around whether a man should pay or not. For some people it'll be about who invites who. Mm. For some people it will be about age and seniority, you know, and relative positions of power. I know that, you know, I've been very influenced by my time in Italy where, you know, if you invited somebody, that meant that you paid. Um, you know, that's the kind of general rule, usually, that the person who invites should also offer to pay. And, and that would generally be what I would, my impulse would be to do that. But that's in exactly, the UK, exactly. it would be more normal, really, to split the bill more often than not, I think. That's exactly what my student said. My student, uh, I think she was from Colombia, and this actually happened to her. So my student was Miller, except her name oh. isn't Miller. I've changed the name, but but um, she she was asked to go for dinner, and then the guy then says, "Can we pay half the bill?" And she was outraged. She was like, "He invited me," and and so some of us were like, "But invite simply means she, he asked you to go out. It didn't. He didn't say he's gonna pay." And and so it became this really heated but very interesting conversation. And at the end of the thirty minutes of talking about this, I think my students all realized that we all have very di different perspectives of something as simple as who pays for the bill. Yeah. Definitely. And, and everybody seems to be agreeing this. And yeah, Alan's saying Latin America, the man always pays. Oh, yeah, that's another one. The gentleman always <laughs> pays. Do they? And do we, Germany half and half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it depends. It's context is everything, I think. Yeah. And so those three questions are just three of six questions that are from a quiz from Voices Elementary. You notice the questions are really, really simple to understand, but the concepts are deep. Because I always say, just because they're elementary students doesn't mean that they don't have deep, deep thoughts, right? And, and I think it's, it's a great chance for students to work in pairs, uh, in groups, small groups, to compare those answers and, and to really talk about them. And what I often find is if students have a strong opinion about something, it doesn't matter if they're beginner or elementary, they always manage get to get that language out. Yeah. <laughs> when you really want to talk, you talk, don't you? It's needing, it's feeling that urge to, and, and this is definitely something that motivates people wanting to kind of discuss these things. And, you know, it, it's that moment, like you said, the eureka moment, the revelation that actually, you know, a lot of these things, people will never have questioned them because if they're, especially if they're living most of their lives in a specific place with a specific group of people, it's even less likely that they'll have questioned their own assumptions. And it's actually really healthy for any learning experience to do that. So, so it's an opportunity and really stimulating to people and memorable, you know, so the language they use to do these things, they're more likely to remember it because they'll remember the really interesting discussion that they had. Mm, absolutely. You know, I, I often say if, if we are spending time in class saying, oh, in pairs, tell your partner what you did this weekend or what you're going to do the next weekend or where you're going on holiday. Those are interesting topics and, and can be fun. But mm. sometimes I, I don't know about you. I get my students who go, don't know, nothing. 
I'm going to sleep this weekend. And this is all you can get out of them. But I think when my students are, are engaged in something kind of controversial, then, you know, the, the, the topic is controversial, but they're still using, you know, the English, the resources, the language resources they know to, 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 to negotiate meaning and to try and kind of, you know, put their point across. And those are my favorite lessons because th there's so much speaking in English that happens. Definitely. It gives them the chance to surprise each other too. Yeah, oh yes. I think they, <laughs> that's also when they really listen to each other. As opposed to, I just give my opinion in English and then I shut down and I wait for the teacher to say the next thing. Here, they're really listening to each other because they really want to know their classmates' opinions. Those opinions actually matter. And that's what we need to do is give them speaking tasks that matter. Um, the cultural iceberg is, is, is a key one. Um, I, I, I refer to the cultural iceberg all the time because so far when we talked earlier about, you know, food and festivals and the arts and even the way we greet each other or the way we take turns, mm. those are just the tip of the iceberg. I think what we want to do with intercultural skills is not just stop at the tip of the iceberg. To, it's like what you said earlier, Rachel, exploring the why. Let's go beneath the water level and to really understand what gives rise to those behaviors, those customs, what are the attitudes, the beliefs, the values that underlie that behavior? And through understanding that, it helps us to gain awareness, not just of the other person, but of ourselves as well, our own beliefs and attitudes and how that might be similar or different from the people we're speaking to. Mm. So here's an example of how the way we do things our behaviors might be different. And, 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 you know, if you look under the iceberg, you might discover a bit more. So a quick experiment here. Have you done this before, Rachel? If you haven't, I'm going to make you do it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to make people do it in the chat. Let, we're going to make people do it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Like everybody just type the first words and the first things that you notice. Okay. So I you're going to look at yeah. a photo for five seconds first. Don't type anything. And then when I take the photo away, I want you to put in the chat field, what do you remember from the photo? What do you see yeah. in the photo? Okay. There's no right or wrong answers, but it might reveal something to you about yourself. Um, that's the interesting side. Three, four, five. <laughs> We've got Allah is saying nature. Oh, okay. Celia, landscape, trees, picnic, family and friends, green hills, family under the tree. Lots of oh, picnic, wow. people noticing the food. Very interesting. Cottage, connection. Harmony. Harmony. Oh. Some very poetic answers here. Right. Why am I doing this experiment with you? Uh, I'm going to play you a video from Voices Intermediate, and perhaps that might give you a clue as to why I did this experiment with you. Uh, let me know if you could see if, if you can see the video. Have you noticed that we write our addresses on envelopes differently in different cultures? In London, UK, the name of the receiver comes first, the door number and street name follow, then the city and postcode. It goes from the individual to the whole. But in Tokyo, Japan, the address goes from the whole to the individual, starting with the postcode and ending with the name of the receiver. We also see this pattern in the way we write our names. In Western countries, the title and the individual's given name usually come first, and then the family name. From the individual to the whole. In some Asian countries, such as Japan, the family name usually comes first, and then the individual's given name and their title. From the whole to the individual. A similar difference was noticed in an experiment done with a group of American and Japanese people. If you saw this fish tank, what would you remember? The fish in front. All the plants in the background. The small animals. All the shells and rocks. Did you notice which way most of the fish were swimming? Or when one fish changed direction? 
Scientists found that the American people were more likely to start by describing the individual fish in the foreground, whereas the Japanese people were more likely to start by describing the background. The Japanese people also talk more about the non-moving objects and the relationships between the objects. This is because we all process information differently and have different ways of making sense of the world. Some people see things from part to whole. They often focus on the foreground and the individual's characteristics. Others might tend to have a more whole to part way of thinking. They often focus on the big picture, the context, the overall idea. They tend to see everything as connected. Everything depends on each other. So relationships, the situation, the background information are all important. Part to whole and whole to part people pay attention to different things and remember different things. When there is a problem, they might also point out different reasons for the problem. Part to whole people might immediately look for specific causes, while whole to part people are more likely to consider the history, the context, and the relationships involved. <laughs> is it SpongeBob, says Alan. <laughs> So Rachel, are you a whole to part? I mean, these are tendencies, right? We don't want to overgeneralize, but do, do you think you tend towards whole to part thinking or part to whole thinking? Well, this was a real re revelation for me here, actually, when I read this within the manuscript, because um, I actually realized that all along I've been a whole to part person. And I tend to think of things more about overarching concepts or an abstract idea rather than and then to start to work out the details. And it really made me realize in some of my own interactions with people where I felt like they'd been focusing in on the details straight away. And I, for me, it felt like, oh, it's far too soon because we haven't worked out the thing that unites everything, you know? And it really gave me an insight into that um, that I hadn't recognized before. We are so similar. I, when I have conversations with my husband, he's constantly like, you know, come on, get on with it. What's the point you're trying to make? It's all, enough with the background information. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he's the opposite right he starts with the, with, with the part and 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 he starts telling me about the, the the main point of the conversation and I'm like whoa I have no context here what what do you yeah. do this for um and, and of course I think the idea is to first be aware that people process information differently and then to try and perhaps adapt when we meet people who are different from us so if you can see here, we have a communication skills box in, in, in every lesson when we deal with uh, a different communication skill, we often have a communication skill box with a couple of easy to remember tips and strategies. And here, the strategy is this, be patient, listen and ask questions, try to see things from their point of view. If they're whole to part thinkers and you're not, make connections between what they're saying and the main topic, help them to see those connections. If they're part to whole thinkers and you're not, then help them to see the connections you notice by discussing them. So little tips like that, that can actually make a, a real difference to the way you communicate with people who have different styles from your own. And then after learning those tips, we can then get students to apply those tips in a little scenario like this. So these little critical incidents, these little stories, I'll give you a moment to read that. I'm not gonna explore it too much because of time, but just wanted to give you a feel of the type of stories that we use to help students apply those communication strategies. And you can kind of see what's going on here, can't you? That, you know, maybe the teacher is trying to seek a more collaborative kind of consensual way of getting the student to work with a and the student is maybe expecting something much more directive and prescriptive from the teacher. You know, they, they just want to receive instructions. Maybe that's what they're used to. That's the way the kinds of relationships they have, they've had with teachers before, maybe. Yes, yes. Those expectations sometimes is just built upon your own experiences in mm. the past with teachers from the past. Absolutely. Um, Piotr is making kind of an interesting point here. He's asked about whether Voices is a business English course book or a general English course book. Voices is very much a general English course book. And, and as much as these, yes, you're absolutely right. These skills, these intercultural skills are essential in business, but they're also essential in our day-to-day -day, um, use of English. You know, when our students learn general English, 
they're not only learning it, as we said earlier, to, to, to order food in a restaurant, they're learning it to build relationships, to build friendships, um, to have those interactions, whether it's with a landlord or with your boyfriend's mother. Um, and, and, and those relationships might feature these intercultural misunderstandings, mm. miscommunication. And that's why mm. these skills are so important, not just for business English students, but for anyone and everyone. And they're transferable to any language, including their own language, too. You know, they can take that back to their own language. You know, the, the things that they learn for English are not necessarily exclusively for English. Absolutely. And I even had teachers say to me, you know, I've used your material and I've realized that I've learned stuff that I'm then applying to my own relationships at home with my husband. And it really works. So voila, you know, teachers are getting to learn something, too. It's a win win. <laughs> So just very quickly, so students get these little stories, these little scenarios, they get to talk about it, unpack it with their groups, with their partner. They, they get to talk about what advice they might give these characters in these stories, which are all based on real life situations. We give them some useful language to then role play those scenarios in a different way. So let's have that conversation again and see how you can improve on it. Can you apply those communication skills you've just learned and make that conversation better? Here's some useful language to help you do that. And this is again from the same lesson about processing information. I know we are really running out of time. We had so much, so much to show you. Look at all this. Um, <laughs> but um, I will leave you with these three things. Um, we look at intercultural skills in voices because we know that these three things are so important for students when they use English outside the classroom. The importance of being aware of themselves, how they operate, how they communicate, but also awareness of other people that they communicate with. The ability to explore and understand the other person better and to have that behavioral flexibility, adaptability, so that they can approach any intercultural communication, any intercultural relationship, and make that relationship work for them. Would you like to add anything, Rachel? <laughs> I, sorry, I was quickly typing a response to Diraj. You asked, is there any advice for third culture kids? And I, and I think that it raises an important point. Really, in Voices, we, we also explore identity and um, through communication. Um, in voices and which would be very, very relevant to third culture kids but in some respects I think we're all going to become third culture kids to in some way or another in this interconnected world that we live in you know our identity is not as binary as it might have been in the past and that's why the types of things that we've talked about today are so important I think because we all need to be able to navigate between different cultures and to bring with us this kind of toolkit of skills that Chia has been talking about um, to, to really ensure that we can forge positive relationships and have really successful communication and communicative encounters with people. So um, thanks for that question. And thanks for, for um, joining us today um, and being so active in the chat. It was great to share everyone's thoughts. It was so fast that I couldn't actually keep up with all of it. So I'm going to copy the chat so I can read through it afterwards. But um, thank you very much, everyone, for your contributions. Um, and I hope you enjoyed um our conversation today yes indeed thank you very much yeah actually just to sort of mirror that as well thank you all for coming today um i was sort of monitoring the chat all the way through and there was such great interaction such so many great comments in, in you know reaction to what you were both saying so clearly it's a topic that is close to many people's hearts and i think you know living in the world that we're living in it, it has to be um you know so many of us are living in multicultural environments I think all three of us are in multicultural families. Um, you know, Rachel with her Turkish, Shia with her Singaporean roots and her British family. I, I, Irish, Irish husband. I, Irish, sorry. <laughs> Myself with a Venezuelan wife. You know, it, it's everywhere. We, look, we have to learn and understand how things are different in other cultures and adjust our behaviour, or at least show an understanding of other cultures in that going forward. So thank you so much once again, Shia and Rachel. It's been a real, real pleasure. And certainly it's a topic that we could talk about for, for hours and hours and hours. Um, one hour is certainly not enough. <laughs> thank you so much, Alex, for having yeah. us. Well, no, thank Thanks, you. Alex. That's my pleasure. And to everyone else, um, thank you once again. But before we, we leave, I just have a couple of, sort of not notices for you. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, you will receive an email from Zoom tomorrow. 
This will include your certificate. It will in include a link to the recording and it will include a link to a lesson and a lesson plan from Voices as well. But if for any reason that kind of lands in your junk or your spam email, don't worry, we will email you next week in case you missed it with a link to request a sample of Voices as well. But you know, there's more that we can offer as well at National Geographic Learning. We have a whole load of webinars um, that you can get your teeth into, much like this very greedy, I think, uh, <laughs> squirrel, um, where you can find out more information about other courses, um, talk to some other authors and teacher trainers, as well as our In Focus blog, where you can connect and read. Actually, she has written a blog to go along with this webinar, which can be found there as well. And also you can connect with us on social media as well. And then the final thing is the next webinar in the series of this Voices launch is on the 23rd and 25th of February, which will be with the course author, Marek. And my pronunciation is gonna be terrible here, but I think it's Kishkowiak, um, or Kishkowiak maybe. Um, apologies for any mispronunciation. And that is on the 23rd and 25th of February. Um, if you scan the QR code, it will take you to the registration pages, okay? Um, so thank you ever so much again to all of you, and thank you especially to Cheer and Rachel for your insightful discussion. Um, certainly there's plenty of food for thought there, and uh, yeah, have a lovely evening, and we'll see you again on Friday if you fancy coming for a second, second time. Okay, bye-bye everybody, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.